you through con season. This was our very successful and fun talk last year, and uh, hopefully it'll be just as, as successful and fun this year. If we can go to the next slide, we're going to introduce our uh, host and sponsor, Atlas Workplace. And Sothan from Atlas is going to tell us about uh, what they offer here. Well, thanks for coming in, guys. You're probably kind of uh, probably new to the space. We are new to the area as well, too. We're about uh, seven months old. Uh, so we're just kind of young and new and just kind of getting our, our foot you know, wet down in this area. So uh, we're doing a lot of community outreach as well, too. But we are sort of a flexible co-working space, uh, not traditional to your office uh, sharing spaces or co-working spaces just around town. So uh, tonight we'll be able to receive a, a two-day promotion if you're up in the area. Stop in um, and get some work done, meet with the clients. We've got a whole bunch of office solutions and, and different ways of working around here. So. Um, I want to get you guys back uh, into your meeting here. So um, look out for your emails. It's easy to unsubscribe. So we're not skewing out any spams or newsletters like that uh, for tonight's event. So uh, enjoy the event. If you guys got any questions, we'll be here at the front as well, too. We've got price and structures and things like that for our membership, too. So thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. Okay, so first up, uh, we can go to the next one. First up, we're going to do networking basics. That's not TCP IP. That's not UDP. It's actually getting out and meeting people and learning about them without dying. Um, you wouldn't be a game developer if you could just talk to everybody that you wanted to, um, and, or at least that's what you tell yourself. Uh, so in this presentation, we're going to learn how to find, make, and keep the connections that you make uh, at any event and how to make it look easy. Uh, next slide. Do you want me to drive the slides? Would that be easier? OK. Um, OK, so how to prepare for a networking event. Um, you should always have your portfolio. Either it's virtual, or it's, it could actually be real, or it could entirely be in your head. But you should know what you do and know how to present it to people who are interested in what you do. So um, if you're a coder, you should have code examples on your laptop. Um, if you have a, a game that actually runs, uh, maybe try an executable on your uh, phone or your tablet. Um, if you're an artist, make sure that you have uh, even, a, even a hard copy sketchbook or, again, images on your tablet. These can't be on a website. You never know what you're going to be without Wi-Fi or 4Gs that you can actually go to your website. You should have these saved on any device that you're looking for. Um, design examples, levels or prototypes done up in a game engine already. Um, a sketchbook of what you're working on now, be that code or art or anything else. Uh, a prototyping kit. This is kind of uh, it's kind of interesting from a design perspective, but uh, Raf Koster, in his book Theory of Fun, talks about a whole prototyping kit, which has index cards as well as playing cards, as tarot cards, coins for flipping, coins for tokens, dice, uh, styrofoam cups for uh, additional tokens, or for ways to to hide game pieces from each other. That's an extensive prototyping kit. You could probably get by with some coins, some dice, and some cards especially if you're looking at basic game mechanics. Um, and then, of course, always know what you've shipped. Um, publish this on your own website or on LinkedIn uh, before your networking event. And uh, business cards, they're essential. Um, it seems like everybody has them. It seems like everybody's boring. But you'll never, you'll never think badly of business cards again when you get home from a convention and you're going through all these business cards and you realize these are all people that I know now. So we can go to the next slide. Um, on the day of any networking event, uh, conference, trade show, or other gathering, you're always networking. Um, it's entirely optional. Yeah. These slides are going to be available later. Yes. These, this is a Google Slides deck, so we'll share that. Yeah. Um, uh, it's entirely optional to always be on. Sometimes you just want to turn it off. But there are actual networking events. Mixers, dances, happy hours, things like that. Um, and you, you will want to go to those. Um, and, but there are dozens of other informal opportunities to network. Show floors, before talks, in the hallways, at the bar, at the check-in. Uh, so what you will always need is business cards, a pen, and the intestinal fortitude to actually go out and meet people. Can we go to the next slide? Meeting people is hard work. It does take your energy. We fall on a spectrum of extroversion and introversion. Nobody's a true introvert. Nobody's a true extrovert. Um, save up your energy for these things if you need to. It's okay to sleep all afternoon if you know that you have a 90-minute networking event later on. 
Um, but there's no such thing as a pure extrovert or a pure introvert. Such a man would be in the lunatic asylum. That's Carl Jung, the guy who invented introverts and extroverts. Um, and that's his spelling for extrovert. It's an important word. Game industry is massively collaborative. You're never not working with somebody unless, of course, you're not. And he's not working with anybody anymore. Uh, it requires great empathy unless, of course, you're not. And he's not working with anybody anymore. Your collaboration and empathy can be improved by meeting and talking to new people at a steady rate. Unless, of course, you're not. And you live in a mansion all by yourself in Beverly Hills. It'll take practice, but it's easy to learn and easy to get hooked. If we can have the next slide. Please let's not post this video where I'm making fun of Notch. Um, instead of the star of your own story, be the director of your own story. As a director, you want your movie to include a great story, right? With lots of cool characters that you hope your audience will enjoy. This is networking. You're not the star of your movie, you're the director of your movie, and I'll get into that in the next slide. Uh, goals, you should make a solid connection. All you have to do is match a face and a name with a fact. It can be simple. Blue shirt, Mike, designer. It can be complex. Blue shirt, tall and fat. Works on a science fiction game, likes Space 1999. Um, return the favor, but only if asked. Remember, you're the director, not the star. So it's more important that you met Pete and you know he works for AIE than it is that I met Pete and he knows that I work for Amazon, right? You're networking, which means that you're adding more nodes you're not becoming a central node yourself. Um, don't force yourself on anybody. Hey, hi, hi, how you doing, huh? Hi, did you come here a lot? Don't force yourself on anybody. Tell me your story is should be your mantra rather than let me tell you a story. You can have the next slide. Um, apply the knowledge, what you just learned, right? So if you learned, if you met Pete and you know that he works at AIE, then you meet Ty later, you say, hey, you know what? Pete works at AIE, and they're looking for faculty, right? Maybe you, know, maybe you know what Pete's looking for. Maybe you just made that fact up by yourself. But apply the knowledge. That'll help you remember more that Pete works at AIE, and it'll help you more uh, remember more that you told Ty to meet Pete. Solidify the connection. Find the person on LinkedIn and ask for the connection. And if they reject you or if they don't ever actually respond to your invitation, don't worry. It's not life and death, it's just LinkedIn. Next slide. Do listen. We're communicating beasts, we know when you're not listening. If I'm talking to you and you're looking straight over my shoulder at somebody else, we know you're not listening. Um, and encourage people to talk to you. Work on safe, leading questions. Like, what do you do? That sounds like fun, is it? Uh, what's your favorite part of the conference so far? What are you playing these days? It's, remember, these are not opportunities for you to layer in your own story or your own experience. It's opportunities for you to listen to other people tell their stories. Mix, focus on meeting more people rather than cling to just a few. And on the next slide, we'll have some don'ts. Don't crowd. We all wish we had friends at these things. Sometimes you're alone. You're not that friend. Don't beg. You're not gonna get a job, a deal, a free game, a t-shirt, a free Xbox, or anything like that from anybody here. You're just making solid connections in your, in your professional network, right? And if you're at Oculus Connect and they're giving away free phones again, lucky you. But if you didn't get a free phone, don't try to show up to events to just beg. Maybe that joke isn't that funny. And I'm guilty of this myself. Sarcasm isn't universal. Irony isn't universal either. The failure mode of clever is asshole, uh, as uh, John Scalzi, science fiction writer, says. Also, finally, it's not a dating mixer. You're not there to meet anybody that you're romantically interested in, because, uh. Okay, how to fake it. Some secrets to getting over the heebie-jeebies. Listen to the words, not the person. Well, one of the greatest interviewing techniques is to just sort of continue on with your questions and look the person dead in the left eye, right? Uh, print reporters, TV reporters, all sorts of reporters look people right dead in the left eye. Do you know why they picked the left eye? Because they didn't pick the right eye. It's entirely arbitrary. And if you're, uh, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's blind in the left eye, you can switch to the right. But just focus on one eye, make sure that you're paying attention, visual attention as well as auditory attention. Repeat the important parts to yourself, so I know that Pete works at AIE. 
I know he's talking to me about something important right now, but what's really important is that I remember that this guy is Pete. He's wearing a Seahawks hat, and I know that he works at AIE. Focus on your goal. If you're thinking about yourself, about yourself what you're going to say next, how to correct the person you're talking to. No, actually, Wolf and Thane came out in 1992, right? You're not going to keep focus. You're not going to, for, you're not going to remember that this person is Pete and he works at AIE. Keep the bar low. Say to yourself, I'm only going to stay for an hour. I'm only going to get three business cards. I'm only going to talk to three people. Or I'm only going to talk to four people. If you keep the bar low, but try to hit that bar, you're going to end up surprising yourself with your own results. And next. And that is it. Are there any questions about networking or mixers or anything like that? We'll have opportunities for questions at the end of the presentations as well. Excellent. So next up is Ty. Ty has presented, Ty, you've shown a game or you've worked at a booth at nine PAXs? Nine PAXs, probably 100 booths. Awesome. Throughout Outstanding. Everything. Yeah. I thought I had done a lot of trade shows, but you've done a few more. Yeah. Uh, Ty will talk to us about convention basics. Now, for extra points, Ty has not seen these slides before. <laughs> I'm sorry, he might have been cheating. I looked through them for about 30 seconds. Either way, I was just going to talk out of my head and I'll just try to keep to the slides. Okay, let me read these with you. <laughs> okay, yeah. What to do before you even get to, uh, to PAX or wherever convention you're showing. I'm just going to use PAX as an example because it's for very, very soon. Um, first of all, make sure you test your build first. I've actually seen so many people show up with a build that, surprise, it doesn't work. And the same applies for the hardware that you, uh, you show on. Uh, my, my least favorite story to tell with this is I have a, a close friend whose name I will not name who was demoing his game on the Wii U uh, for some big GDC event that he had prepared a lot for. Uh, however, the Wii U dev kit turns out to have way, way more RAM than the Wii U uh, actual demo kit that Nintendo forced him to show on. Needless to say, the game didn't work at all and he spent the entire booth that he paid $400 for showing a trailer. Don't do that. Test on the actual hardware or have a backup PC if you're showing on a console. Um, make sure you make all of your printout materials way in advance. Uh, this goes for business cards, flyers, banners, uh, anything that you need printed, uh, especially if you use uh, sites like Vistaprint, which are actually very good. They could take two or three weeks, so uh, if you're doing going to PAX and doing this, do that tonight. Um, and uh, nail down your pitch. Essentially an elevator pitch that you're going to be talking to a thousand people about, uh, if not if not more, if you have a uh, key PAX booth. Uh, how do you describe your game in two words? If you have a really complex game that you need several paragraphs essentially talking to someone, you're not doing it right. You need to nail down the pitch and let the game explain the rest. Next. The things to actually bring. Um, obviously bring all your hardware uh, I don't think it says that on the slide, but uh, don't forget a cable that plugs your TV in. Uh, don't forget HDMI cables. In fact, if you have extras, bring extras. HDMI, HDMI cables are crazy cheap. Buy an extra one. Um, basically, just assume that everything's going to break. If you have a keyboard and mouse based game, bring an extra keyboard and mouse that hopefully you don't need to use. If you're using a local multiplayer game, uh, bring extra Xbox 360 controllers. One of them is going to break, or whatever controller you're using. Um, actually, uh, side note, if you're making a multiplayer game, wired controller is not wireless because at PAX there's so much radio interference that wire, wireless controllers likely won't work. Bring extra laptops if you have them, uh, extra everything. In terms of things to uh, take care of yourself, um, if you're standing for 10 hours straight, you're going to need lots of water. Um, I like coffee. I usually get a, a crepe or two of uh, coffee in a thermostat that I can pour myself so I don't have to actually go uh, wait in line with the rest of the PAX goers to get coffee because that's just a waste of time I could be spending in my booth. Um, you know, bring your maybe a single clothing back up, uh, lots of snacks. I like, um, I like, like, uh, Nature Valley bars. They're really quick, easy. Um, they fill you up. Uh, something like that. Nothing that's going to get your hands sticky. Nothing that you have to touch because then you have the PAX pox. Um, bring lots of hand sanitizer. For the love of God, bring lots of hand sanitizer. I bring dozens of jars of it, not, or squirt bottles or whatever, and I put them out around the booth just because I don't want anyone else who comes to the booth to get PAX box. Bring a lots and lots of hand sanitizer. Um, yeah, next. Um, so this slide's dedicated to taking care of yourself. Um, this reminds me of one thing I didn't mention, which is lots of thrill lozenges. 
you're going to be talking probably constantly the entire time, bringing packs of throat lozenges to kind of help your voice. Um, in addition to the water and snacks, uh, I also like to pack a lunch. PB and J's are you know great. You can hold them in a baggie and, and just eat them without touching them. Um, and get plenty of sleep. Easier said than done during packs when there are after parties that go out to 2 a.m. every night and they expect you to get up by 9 a.m. To, to show your booth. If at all possible, have a, a friend or the rest of your team help. Uh, running a single booth at packs by yourself is nearly impossible. It's, it's definitely a masochism of some kind. Um, if you're a single uh, developer team, get a friend, uh, beg a friend if you have to, but don't try to do it yourself. That way at least you can take breaks, you can sleep. Um, yeah, next. Uh, there's miscellaneous things to take in addition to uh, spare HDMI cables, bring spare power cords, uh, power strips. PAX uh, is not going to provide anything but power. Uh, they're not going to uh, provide TVs, obviously, either. Um, basically, just have a um, anything that could go wrong will go wrong mentality. So, uh, scissors in case you need to cut things, tape, uh, zip ties. Um, basically, it, it's almost like camping, you got to be prepared no matter what happens, except it's at PAX. Um, if you're at the mega booth, uh, you know, you can find uh, the mega booth helpers to, to get you some core essentials if you need to, but otherwise, basically, try to plan for everything yourself if you can. Okay, so, um, PAX comes with power, but not internet. If you need internet, uh, hopefully you don't need internet. If I'm showing an MMO, uh, or something like that at a uh, at a convention is only going to end in a disaster, especially as an indie, because even if you buy internet, something will happen and it will go down. Um, run all the cables ahead of time. Make sure there's no exposed cables. Gap everything down if you need to, but essentially just try to hide all the cables to make it look nice. Um, in terms of setting up your booth, my ideal booth is as much um, audience throughput as possible. Um, Two examples, one for the bridge, I had a 10 by 10 booth at once at PAX where I had a single TV and a single station where people could play and they usually paid for like 20 minutes to half an hour each. This was two players per hour and it was awful. With Tumblestone, uh, I had a 10 by 10 booth with 12 different spots for people to play the game and we got people in and out and on average we had two or three players per minute. So you want as many people playing the game as, as humanly possible. You want to, uh, so you can go back. You want to set up as many um, signs for your game as possible. Um, just having your game shown on a TV or screen isn't enough for people to uh, like have the game title stick. You want people to walk away from your booth and knowing, knowing exactly what that was called. Uh, for Tumblestone, we had TVs with like banners in front of all the TVs. We splashed the name of the game on the TV between rounds. We had gigantic banners uh, both uh, on the back and on, on the sides. And I found banners, you can look it up online, like 10 foot by 6 foot banners that staple on the back of a PAX booth for like $150, really high quality, but highly recommend doing something like that. Just get the, the name of your game out as much as you possibly can, get to stick. And on that note, um, I recommend printing off uh, business card uh, business cards with uh, game information, basically just game, title, nice art, a website, uh, just for people to take. And uh, when you're pitching the game to people just uh, at PAX, just have them in your hand and give them a card with the game on it. Uh, as you're talking to them. It's a little rude to do that if you're networking with your own card, but at, at PAX, just like, here's the card for the game, take it, please. Get the game in the out as much as possible when you set up your group. Oh, um, so in terms of actually running the booth, um, you want to be as, as warm and, and greeting as possible for people. people at PAX are not usually that timid, but like when I showed a game at, at, in Japan, you had to like actually hand someone the controller and ask them three times to play the game, and so it can go from either end of the spectrum. Uh, don't be afraid to invite people in. If someone looks curious, absolutely ask them to play. Um, a lot of times you'll have groups of people uh, wanting to go, so if someone looks curious, act, uh, make sure everyone in the group like you know knows about the game. You're talking to everyone. That sort of thing. And uh, most importantly, look at everyone's badge. If it says media, for the love of God, talk to that person. Don't let anyone with a yellow badge, a uh, media badge, uh, walk by. Just like run out of the hallway, say, stop, hey, just look at my game. Absolutely, you know, pimp your game out to media as much as, as humanly possible. They're the ones um, who actually matter in terms of packs because, you know, if they write a good article, then you have 10,000 eyeballs, not just one. Um, next. 
uh, especially if your game isn't out, if it's like halfway done, you're still looking for feedback, I recommend carrying around a notebook, uh, like a small little notebook that fits in your pocket and a pencil that you can write down every single piece of feedback that you receive. Uh, this slide has a, a lot of um, good notes on, on what to write down. Uh, basically, you can treat uh, showing at an exhibit as um, a, a great way for, for free feedback in, in person that you can actually look over their shoulder. One tip I have is that you should absolutely not say anything if you're looking for honest feedback. Don't be like, oh, go through this door, or you know, do this, do that. Let them figure it out, and if they're having like uh, a lot of trouble figuring something out, write that down and you can uh, iterate on that later and, and basically uh, get a lot of good feedback without actually them saying anything. Because in fact, most people probably won't say anything. They'll just like nod and smile and, and go through it, but when you see some obvious uh, usability issues, you'll, you'll, as the designer and developer, know uh, for sure. Oh right, and people give terrible feedback. Um, so you should you should not actually take every single uh, piece of advice you get from random players. If you're talking to a you know established game designer, that's an entirely uh, different sentiment. But from random people at PAX, they're going to give the worst uh, pieces of feedback, and they're going to suggest things that you change. But don't actually listen to what they suggest. Uh, watch what they do. Watch what they're having issues with, and figure out how to fix it yourself. Their their suggestions are. Probably going to be not not the best one because they're not game designers. But basically, listen to why they're saying what they're saying and um, not what they're actually saying. But still, regardless, write down everything and perhaps come back to it later. Um, and one also kind of tangential piece of advice, but um, I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, when you make your you know very stable, ready for packs build, uh, make sure I, I recommend having a demo mode. Just in case you're off talking to people, have a game that essentially runs itself. If someone puts down the controller, it can you know detect, oh, no one's played it for 30 seconds, maybe we'll restart it from back from the beginning, uh, that sort of thing. Do as much as you possibly can to get it uh, packs ready. Oh, this also uh, reminds me, you should probably disable the ability to change settings without some kind of cheat code. I once had someone like come up to uh, the bridge while I was showing it, turn off the volume, change some graphic setting, put down the controller, and walk away. Uh, it was very weird, but at that point, I always disable settings. <laughs> In, uh, in PAX builds because you don't have to deal with that kind of thing. It very much might happen. And just in terms of packing up, uh, obviously throw away all your trash. Be respectful to you know PAX uh, in terms of anything valuable. Put that away kind of first. Uh, don't walk away from your booth with anything too valuable there. It's tempting to go get a, a drink after the, the first day. Uh, and just like leave everything there. But make sure everything gets put away after every day. Um, everything else is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, don't forget anything. Just do a triple check. Make sure if you found it, you, you leave it as you found it. Chris? Have fun? <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ty. Okay. Next up is uh, media relations. Oh. Ty, go ahead. Questions. Please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Questions. Anything like that? Oh, totally. Uh, uh, and especially VR. Have <laughs> uh, extreme sanitation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hand sanitizer, wipes, tax pots, and grill. I always flip all the tablecloths up. They're coming to grab them anyway, so I flip the, the edges up so you can just see right underneath the tables before you're walking away. Uh, very important. But well, when you have larger groups. Right. Indeed. Okay, so Ty brushed on talking to the press. Um, this next part of the presentation is how to talk to the press. Um, previously, this was given by a PR professional with uh, multiple decades in PR. Uh, now it's going to be given by a marketing professional with multiple decades in marketing. So not a lot of distance between the two, but there's significant difference. So um, we're gonna talk about how to uh, get, your, uh, get your game and get yourself in front of the press. Uh, knowing what you're talking about is just part of the equation. So uh, there are two types of media, owned versus earned media. Owned media is any advertising or account or website or blog where you're driving content. So if you buy Google Ads, if you've got a Twitter account, if you've got a Facebook page or your own website, you own these channels so you can control the message through those. However, earned media has a lot higher reach. Uh, site, blog, social media account, podcast, or anything like that that belongs to somebody else. 
you have limited control over that message and that's who you're going to be talking to a lot when it comes to trade shows and conventions like this. Go ahead. Earned media is useful because it's, even though it sounds risky, it's still very valuable. Here's why. It's third party validation, uh, possibly from an industry heavy hitter, like somebody who, uh, somebody who has a lot of readers and those readers respect that person because they provide valuable information about games that are coming out that's going to be a lot more uh, valuable to you than putting up another dozen screenshots about your amazing game. Um, building awareness isn't a one-person job, right? You're building a game right now. You're not out there to do your own marketing and PR. So what next best thing that you can do is talk directly to the press. Um, everyone's watching and who's getting coverage at shows. Buzz is important, right? So if you're out there making Tumblestone and Tumblestone suddenly has uh, 40 hits from press coverage at, at PAX, whereas your competitive, the indie game you're competing against only has a few hits from coverage at PAX, that tends to snowball. Chances are that the blogger or the reporter that you're talking to, even if they just have a podcast that they do twice a month, they still probably have more traffic than you. Um, now multiply that a few times. Uh, PR is an online bullhorn, right? Because that blogger or that, uh, that podcaster has uh, many more listeners or readers than you do, and they have many more friends than you do, right? It, it just snowballs. Um, it also illustrates that you're participating in an industry conversation beyond your own content discussion community. In other words, this means that you're a part of the industry that you claim that you're a part of, right? Just being out there, just being featured as a game developer, that's the first step of validation. Next step of validation is obviously publishing and selling and putting the game in front of the hands of the players, but this is part of the thing that you should repeat to yourself every night. I make games. This is a great way to have somebody say, he makes games. How do you prepare? Don't panic. It's just the press. They can kill you, but they can't eat you. Um, everyone gets nervous when talking to the press. It gets easier. Do a little homework about the kind of publication, the readers, the kind of reporter that you're actually going to be dealing with. Get your story straight. Reporters talk to a lot of companies at conferences, make them want to write about you and your game, right? So essentially have like an elevator pitch, right? Know what you're, the, know what you're making, know why you're there, know why you're at that particular conference, and be able to explain that in just a few short sentences to anybody you talk to. Check out who will be there. Um, there's going to be a Twitter hashtag for the event, uh, and save a search for it. See who plans on going, uh, find the reporters who are planning on going, and read what they're talking about and posting, right? So you've got, maybe you've got like 10 to 20 people on your, on your hashtag list. Find out when they're arriving, find out um, what they're talking about, what they're excited to see, and make sure that you can talk at least with uh, the level of familiarity about the upcoming themes for the, for the conference or the event. So last year, VR was huge at PAX. Maybe AR will be huge this year. You never know until you start looking at the early buzz. And it's not just PAX, it's all the conventions that we're going to be having in this, in this fall season. Go ahead. What's my story? Think about the three things most critical to convey to any reporter. You, you're probably going to be asked about many more things, but um, you're going to want to be sure to work your three most important things into the conversation. So I'm working on a side-scrolling shooter. It's going to have a whole lot of levels, and it's going to have procedural content that changes every day, right? Those are your three very important things. That's, that's a hook, right? If you're having trouble coming up with those three very important things, here's some, uh, here's some cheats you can use. Uh, what's unique about my game? Why is my story unique, right? Um, what's the player experience? There's a, uh, let's talk about uh, why is my story as the creator unique? There's a uh, word scramble game for iPad where you use, where you, it's kind of like Boggle, where you look and you uh, slide letters in between uh, different layers of this puzzle on the iPad to make new words, right? You get bigger scores for, for the bigger the word is, and um, it's a little bit like Boggle, it's a little bit like uh, Candy Crush, it's a little bit like other word games you may have played. The reason I played and installed that game is because I saw a press story about the creator. The creator made it in Unity and did it entirely with his pinky finger because he was a quadriplegic. 
He was a uh, gifted computer scientist uh, before he had an accident and he needed to be able to provide for his family. So he typed out the entire thing with his pinky finger in, in the code and was able to actually develop a very compelling game for the iPad. That's why I bought the game. You never know when a hook will drive your game into the hands of many more players. What's the player experience? Uh, what led to the creation of the game? Were you sick of current games and wanted to make your own? Um, what's the unique hook behind the creation of the game? How can players play the game, right? Traditionally it's controllers, but sometimes maybe there's, uh, maybe there's a Steam controller sort of hook to it where you can actually perfect your aim or maybe there are um, a variety, maybe you wanted to bring fighting game controls into your side scrolling shooter. Um, and then supporting industry facts and figures, right? You can, you can even make fun of yourself. Everybody's making a first person shooter, but my first person shooter is better and this is why, right? Um, think of your story as a reverse pyramid. Start with bigger ideas and work your way into facts and figures. So, I'm making a side scrolling shooter. Um, I don't know how I'm going to make any of the assets, but I do know that I'm going to do procedural stuff that's different every day you play the game. Um, and then try to get into those, uh, by working in that reverse pyramid, you're essentially writing the story for any media that you're talking to. Don't be afraid of the interview. Remember, they can kill you, but they can't eat you. Keep in mind that reporters are designed to be friendly. They're designed to keep you talking. So sometimes they might have different mannerisms um, than you're used to, right? They, if, especially people who are interviewing you on camera, they're gonna sit there and they're gonna nod at you, right, the entire time. And they're gonna be very quiet, but they're gonna, they're gonna be bouncing in front of you while they're off camera trying to get you to talk, right? They're just pulling more words out of you. Um, reporters hate it when you lie to them, right? So always be honest. Um, they can sniff this out and the more honest you are, the better story you're going to get. Um, don't wing it. Come prepared with notes and just remember to say the same thing that you've said the entire time about your game or about yourself, whatever it is, right? Because whoever's listening, it's the first time they've heard it, even though it's the thousand, thousandth time you've said it. Um, if you don't know the answer to the question, tell the reporter you'll get back with an answer, right? Um, the very best answer to a question that you don't know is, I don't know. I'll get back to you about it though. Um, an interview is not a legal hearing. It's okay to tell a reporter that some information is proprietary. And the easiest way to say that is we're not ready to talk about that right now. Very most important things, because a reporter puts away a notebook or turns off a tape recorder doesn't mean the interview's over. Even if a reporter says that something is off the record, or if somebody if a reporter says this is on the record, or if a reporter says this is off the record, Nothing is ever off the record. They are a reporter because it is your job. It is their job, right? You make games because it is your job, right? But you also make games because it's your avocation. They are reporters because it is their avocation as well, right? They will remember what you told them and they will repeat what you told them. So remember that nothing is ever, ever, ever off the record. Uh, when I first got into video game marketing, my first title was uh, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon, and we launched it for the PC in 2001 when I was at Ubisoft. I remember saying to a reporter uh, that I felt like Ghost Recon was sort of like a short glass of whiskey, and that um, the other title at the time, I want to say Arma 1, or uh, it was pre-Arma, can't even remember the name of the title, but it was also a big military simulator. It actually had some advantages over Ghost Recon, but I said, this game is like a tall glass of water, Ghost Recon's like a refined glass of whiskey. This was off the record, it wasn't in an interview. That reporter then repeated what I said, not attributing it to me, in an online forum where a lot of reporters met, right? They repeated it among themselves, Ghost Recon won Game of the Year. So. You should always pretend that you're always on the record and always be prepared to say something positive, not only about yourself, but about your competition, because you never know. Um, if a reporter makes a statement that you don't agree with, say so. Do you think this game isn't for girls, right? You should not, you should, you should not agree with something like that. You shouldn't just let that slide. You shouldn't nod your head or anything like that, because they're going to put those words into your mouth, right? Pete thinks that this game isn't for girls, right? 
when actually what Pete <laughs> what Pete said was nothing when presented with the question, do you think this game is not for girls? Um, don't answer if you're not sure of a reporter's question. Always ask for a clarification. We call those, when did you stop beating your wife questions, right? Never. I mean, wait, I just started. Wait, what? Right? Just ask for clarification. Never say anything negative about an individual or a company. Well, I used to work for EA, but it turns out they're just in it for the money, right? Don't say that. Uh, and I never used to work for EA. Don't stray from the subject of the interview to comment on the day's news, um, whether that be convention news or politics or anything like that. There are reporters dedicated to whatever else is happening. The reporter who's talking to you is dedicated to you. Reporters like facts and figures instead of just voicing an opinion back it up with facts and figures. Well, it turns out that there are a lot of games in this category. Or you can say, on Steam, I found 440 games in this category. But mine's unique because, and then we continue. The next slide. What if there's video? Don't bounce around like I've been bouncing around here, right? Stay in one plot, stay in one place. Try to keep your head movements to a minimum. Try to look as tall and as handsome as you possibly can. And stay focused on your three messages, right? My game is about this. I did it because of this, and I think players will have a lot of fun with it because of this, right? Look at the interviewer, not the camera. I'm going to say this can do otherwise. Never look at the camera. It's just sort of creepy. Um, don't worry if you mess up. If you're unhappy with something, let them know. They're going to do their best to take out your stuttering, to take out any ums or ahs or anything like that. Just keep on with your spiel, and if something is really messed up, they'll let you re-record it. Be conscious of your facial expression. If you don't smile, try to maintain a neutral, open expression. Um, I have resting psychopath face, so I try to smile as much as possible, except when I'm speaking now. Now it looks like I want to kill something. Um, it's okay to use your hands when you're speaking, but don't do this, right? Because it looks arrogant or even Trumpian. Um, be courteous and pleasant, but don't be afraid to push back if you're uncomfortable, right? Um, as video games journalism has grown and expanded, there are a lot of people who are coming into, the, into journalism from the bottom, right? They could actually be bottom feeders, so uh, if, you, if they say something that you don't agree with, or if there's a question that makes you uncomfortable or something like that, a simple, I don't think we should be talking about that right now, will usually get everything back on track. What's next? You have to follow up with uh, the interview. Get contact info for anyone you want to talk to so you can stay in touch, share news, updates with them moving forward. Now, if you meet a reporter from a publication and they give you an email address, that's an in, right? Send them 20 exclusive screenshots when you're about to publish. They love exclusives, right? Send somebody else 20 different screenshots. They love exclusives as well. Try to drop them uh, little tidbits. Try to follow them on Twitter. Try to maintain a constant bit of communication even if it's just a few sentences every now and then, you have a contact in the gaming press. Exploit that. Follow industry influencers on social media if you aren't already. So start with the publications and then follow the individual reporters and engage with their posts and updates, right? If they're talking about games that you like to play, if you're building a military sim and you're finding you know, three or four reporters that just love to talk about military sims, engage with their tweets, right? And again, the failure mode of clever is asshole. Don't try to be clever, just try to be engaging and talk with them on Twitter or on the forums where they post on. Make sure to comment on their stories or even link to their stories and say, great job, great hit. Um, keep your own channels up to date, right? Try to update your website, try to, try to tweet, try to update your Facebook page. Stay active on your own social channels and in industry communities where that makes sense. Players can't play your game if they don't know you exist, and they won't be passionate about, passionate about your game unless you're passionately engaging with them, right? So, if you have something cool to say about your game, my game is cool, make sure you say it yourself, make sure you get a reporter to agree with you and say it herself, and try to make sure that your community agrees with you and says it themselves as well. That should be the last slide. Are there any questions about dealing with the press? Above all, be neutral, friendly, engaging, and remember your three things, and you'll do very well with the press at all times. Thanks. Next up, 
we have Dr. B, um, uh, who's called Dr. B, obviously, for a reason. Um, and he is from the Take This Foundation. Project. The Take This Project. I would love that we, if we had enough money to be a foundation. Okay. And he's going to talk about small talk. Yeah. Um, so, hi. I just Who's heard of Take This? Oh, that's <laughs> awesome! Okay. Nobody's looking. All right. Um, then let's go on to the next slide. Uh, let's just as a recap, because there's a couple of most of you have probably heard about our efforts with the AFK room. It's definitely our most visual, uh, our most visible effort that we do at all the PAX locations worldwide, as well as other conventions like E3, MomoCon, um, and a few others I can't tell you about yet. Uh, but we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Are you all familiar with the IGDA's Crunch Initiative last year? Okay, we wrote the right white paper. Uh, we helped out with that, um, with a lot of those efforts. I actually, I was speaking at the Mobile Games Forum here in Seattle with Kate Edwards. Um, we also do studio consultation if, for mental health practices, full industrial organizational consultation. We do panels and articles with our media partners and on our website at takethis.org. So just thought I'd give you all a little bit of familiarity with some of the other stuff we do that's not the AFK room, though that's by far what we're best known for. Um, let's go to list. Oh, no, back to this. Sorry. Um, in case you're unfamiliar with our mission, by the way, it, we're there to destigmatize mental health concerns. Uh, one in four people will be diagnosed in the United States with a mental health diagnosis within their lifetime, according to the CDC, anxiety disorders being the most common. Um, so it's common, but people aren't talking about it, so that's what we're here for. We're here to educate. But we also get to do fun stuff like this, and now we can bring on the next slide. Um, I want to talk to you about small talk, all right? And raise your hand if you actually like making small talk. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are watching at home, nobody raised their hand. Um, and. That's because it's brutal. I mean, this is one of the things I say to a lot of my clinicians that I train uh, for the AFK room is social anxiety is a real thing in the gaming industry. Social anxiety is a real thing amongst the nerd community. And we, we're, it, we're by and large more on the introverted side of that spectrum. Interacting with a lot of people takes a lot of effort. So small talk is one of those things that's a challenge for a lot of people. And so, um, couple things to quickly go over. One of the best things you can do if you are if you're meeting people for the first time and you're trying to get a feel for what's going on, trying to get to meet them, be socially calibrated. All right? Now this is a concept. Anybody here read Dr. Nerdlove? Oh man, I love Dr. Nerdlove's writing. Okay? If you have if you don't read Dr. Nerdlove, start. All right? Because not only is it good solid dating advice, uh, some, he goes, his real name's Harris O'Malley, uh, but he writes really, really good just socializing advice, all right? The stuff he writes, especially in one of his books, uh, Dating Simplified, most of that's applicable to just meeting people in general. And one of the things he talks about pretty extensively is being socially calibrated, learning to read the expressions of others, knowing when you made a when you made the right move, when they're getting more engaged with you by their body language. But the other thing is knowing when you made a misstep. Um, another good resource is actually a doctoral student down in Oregon by the name of Daniel Wendler, who um, he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum as an adult, and he wrote this wonderful social skills book that. He said, this is the book I would have wanted when I was younger. And he breaks it down into as simple as, do they have a positive reaction? Do they have a negative reaction? Don't have to get more complicated than that with what, they, with what you say. Do they have a negative reaction? If they do, apologize immediately, move on. But if they have a good reaction, then you know, continue on with things. Um, but one of the biggest hurdles a lot of people face in terms of wanting to make that approach and wanting to talk to people at these horrid networking events that we all have to go to at conventions 
Uh, one of the bitter ironies of all of us that take this, all of the directors are horribly, horribly introverted and we all just learn how to fake being extroverts. So at the end of the day, we all just go back to our separate hotel rooms and do nothing. And we're like, okay, uh, y'all want to get out of here and not talk? Cool. Um, so we just go. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we all learned how to do is make mistakes socializing with people. Uh, we heard not to badmouth anybody when you're talking in this industry. First convention I had would take this, I made that mistake. Oh boy, did I never make that one again. Uh, I was talking to a CEO of a well-known gaming accessory company and I was talking like I was at the local gaming store and I was like, oh man, at least you're not having production problems like insert company name here. And he's like, oh dude, I know him. He's a good guy. I'm like, oh crud. Um, okay. That's a good flub for my first convention. Awesome. So you learn to do this and you learn to, from your mistakes and you continue on with your attempts to socialize. Uh, can we go to the next slide? One of the things that uh, Daniel Wendler talks about in terms of making good small talk is balancing what he calls invitation versus inspiration. Now. Invitation, this is the stuff that takes a lot of effort and it's used primarily at the beginning of relationships or when you don't know people particularly that well. It's a lot of open-ended questions that are obvious invitations for them to respond. It's a way of signaling that you're done talking and it's time for their turn. It's a way of soliciting their interests so you can find out what you have in common and like I said, it's used more early on in interactions, but that's a lot of work, all right? I, I'm sure you've all been there where you're the one just asking questions, just asking, asking questions, and there was nothing really spontaneously coming from the other person. Well, that's where inspiration comes in, all right? Once you know you have some things in common with the other person, that's when you can start sharing your thoughts sharing your stories and hopefully inspiring a spontaneous reply. Those are the really fun interactions where you're just riffing off of each other and you're getting to know each other because you've got a lot of mutual interests. Um, in fact, that's often what inspiration will indicate that you do have a lot of mutual interests. And it's also an indication that there is a growing or more established relationship. Uh, one of the things I used to uh, do as a part of my profession is um, I used to teach an adult life skills class well, program for young adults on the autism spectrum. And when we worked on, on uh, conversation skills, the primary rule that I wanted all of them to remember is that the best conversations, because they're two-way, are of interest to both people. But if you can't make it of interest to both people, make it interesting to them, all right? One of the mantras I repeat to myself before I go to these conventions because, um, one, there's some social anxiety going on here. I'm also, I'm mildly on the spectrum, so I, a lot of this stuff I had to learn through trial and error. Um, I'd like to think I had it pretty well at this point. Um, I'm just kind of eccentric. But one of the mantras I have to repeat to myself when I go to conventions, especially when I get nervous, don't be interesting, be interested. All right? Because then I'm trying too hard, and then I, I don't know about you all, but I hate talking to people who obviously have an agenda. All right? They don't give a crap about what I have to say, they just want me to hear them. The best one I ever had was actually a fundraising party for e for um, Take This. This was at NE3, and we were the recipients. And somebody came up to me because they heard somebody calling me doctor, and they're like, oh, this guy must be important. Here, I make jumbotrons. You're the guy in charge of this, right? Here, have my card. I want you to have my card so you can use my jumbotrons. I'm like, I have, okay. All right, you clearly have been not paying attention because if you want to talk about schizophrenia, I'm your guy, but um, the extent of my technical knowledge is, oh, an HDMI cable, cool. Kind of a Luddite for a video game-based mental health group. I'm the one who's like, what's Discord? I still don't actually have Discord. They're finally persuading me to go on to this. But that's, um, that's one of the things I want to repeat. I repeat to myself all the time. Be interested. 
don't try and be interesting because it just it's off-putting to people. The other thing is learning to balance brevity and detail. All right, you're talking to somebody and you you're asking them questions. They're like, yeah, cool. All right. Uh huh. What game do you make, Bob? Where do you go with that? It takes a lot of work to elicit more than that, and if you're the one giving one-word mon you know, monosyllabic answers, there's no way for them to go. But at the same time, if you're launching into your elevator speech with every single person you run into, that's a lot of detail in a short amount of time, and it may not give them a lot of avenues to follow up with, because if they're asking questions about you, that's an indication that they're interested. All right, so you gotta find that balance through trial and error of being brief enough but giving enough detail so they want to hear more. That's where that inspiration thing comes in. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So one of the other things I used to talk about with the kids I worked with, the young adults I worked with, is topics for conversation. And what I break it down to is red light, yellow light, and green light topics. All right, now these are largely based on the idea of what is personal. And thinking, uh, we actually broke down based on the work of a uh, local psychologist, Steve Becker, he broke social relationships down into levels, which for my gaming young adults, it was like, okay, cool, you leveled up in the relationship, they understood that. So when it comes to the level of being a stranger or an acquaintance, there are definitely some topics that are more or less verboten, all right, and these are the red light topics. I mean, what, just give me an answer, what do you think? Something you don't talk about when you first meet somebody. Not Politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, lately they have been somewhat similar. So, uh, uh, so yeah, definitely politics. Why? Because it's personal. It's important to them. Small talk is, by definition, something which is just not of significant importance to most people. All right, it's a safe enough topic. Politics, definitely not. What else? Rel yeah, yeah, politics and religion, right out. Okay, one of the D&D therapy groups I have, that's just one of the rules, no politics, no religion, unless it's Bahamut. Um, that's okay. Tiamat is not allowed in our games, but Bahamut's fine. But, you know, we, politics and religion, what about personal medical details? Physical appearance, all right? God, okay, you've been working hard on losing weight, I've seen from your pictures on your publicity stills. You think they're gonna? Do you think they're gonna email you? No, they'll remember you though. Um, so, so you know, it's really stuff like that that you want to. Uh, their weight, age, uh, their dating life, um, complaints, and negativity often fall into this category. Okay, you may think, kind of like I did, that it was a fun comment, a little sarcastic, didn't go over well. Red light topics. Leave out the complaints. Leave out the negativity, and don't talk about money either. It makes you seem desperate, especially if you're just trying to network with people. Um, let's go on to the next one. Yellow light topics, you can do it. You just gotta be careful, okay? My best friend, in our 20s, I, I, don't, I could not operate the way this guy does. He is one of the most charming people you will ever meet. In fact, so much that we gave him the nickname The Face from the A-Team because he can talk his way out of anything. I once, I once heard about him getting pulled over just, how, uh, just after he got out of the military. And by the time that cop was done with the stop, not only did he not get a ticket, the cop came back and said, son, I'd like to thank you for your service and shake your hand. My best friend could get away with yellow light topics because they have the possibility of being personal or maybe a little not, depending on how you approach it. And maybe that might be their external appearance, like the clothes they choose, all right? You compliment somebody's shoes, it's a lot different than saying, bra's a little lopsided. <laughs> okay, both are technically about the clothes they're wearing. How you approach it is very different. Um, asking about somebody's hometown. Now, to a lot of people, that may be not a big deal. Like, I am, a, I am a shameless Seattle booster. I grew up here. And I will talk about Seattle all day. But for some people, think about the dynamic of the industry. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of people in this industry who are afraid of having their information laid out there. And so this may be a, this may be a sensitive topic, how, depending on how you would talk, approach it. 
uh, personal history, future plans, these are also things that, depending on how you approach it, might be a little risky. Let's go on to the next one. Finally, green light topics. These are generally safe to talk about because they don't have a lot of personal significance to most people. Um, as much as I hate it, hate it, the weather, my students used to drive me nuts because they knew I hated talking about the weather and they loved seeing my reaction to this. Hey, Dr. B, how's the weather? I don't know, it's rainy again? What do you want? <laughs> oh, look, it's foggy. It's gray and it's January. Big shock. Um, not a lot to me, not a whole lot to talk about there. But other things you can talk about, their hobbies. What do you like to do for fun? Wonderful open-ended question. You can figure out what you have in common. But where I like to tell people to start the present situation. Shared situations are often a great source of conversation. How's the convention going for you so far? You just sat in on somebody's panel. What was that like for you? It was great as an audience member. Ask about the shared situation first because you know you have that in common. Um, books, movies, TV, um, food. Who doesn't love food? Heathens. Um, I, I, I find someone who doesn't like food, they will not be my friend. I love food. Um, their work, their job, that's probably of great interest to somebody else. People love talking about what they do, if they, at least if they enjoy doing it. Um, music, sports, and if you have mutual friends, that's a great in. If you know so-and-so that you know the panel presenter knows, then you can talk about your mutual friend and some memories that you have of the two of that person, as, you know, generally as long as they're happy. Um, remember, avoid negativity. Um, so that was the whirlwind tour of small talk. Uh, any questions that you have for me on this? All right. Excellent. Cool. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, it was a little smaller and more cozy than we had hoped, but uh, we did uh, get introduced to a great new venue, and uh, I learned a lot from uh, from Dr. B and from Ty. <laughs> and uh, thanks everybody. If anybody has any questions, now is the time. If not, um, we can go. I guess not. Outstanding. Thanks a bunch, everybody.